We've had a good crowd, but it, that weather has been terrible out there, and although we've had a good crowd, uh, we have been disappointed. Attendance is about half what we had expected for with all the people lined up, but they couldn't get here. But we're, these are the people that were the weather-beaten people that came through regardless. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you a personal friend, a man that I have great respect for, Senator Bob Dole from the state of Kansas. Well, thank you very much, uh, Oren. And I can certainly understand uh, why people would not go out, well, even to hear a politician when it was warm, let alone uh, when it's cold. So I, if those seats are vacant for any reason, I understand. I uh, do travel around a lot. In fact, last year I traveled around a lot and ended up like some farmers without anything. But uh, it was a great experience. I remember when President Ford uh, called me in Kansas City, and I also remember Kansas City a few years ago when I appeared at your national convention, and I, I think Senator Humphrey was on the program that time, and Senator McGovern, and one other Democrat, and then they threw me in. I guess I was the last speaker just as people were leaving town, but it was a great uh, meeting. But I remember uh, when President Ford called me, he said he had tried several other lines and they were busy, and he decided he have, had to have a running mate, so I said yes, and I went over to the hotel where President Ford was, and we exchanged all the pleasantries and did all that. And then we talked about campaign strategy. I often wonder why we didn't use it, but we talked about it. <laughs> I said, Mr. President, I'll take the western half of the country and you take the rest. And I'd really counted on him for a little bit more, but uh, the way it goes, uh, he can't win them all. But I went back to Washington that weekend, and I still couldn't believe that this had happened. And so I went downtown to see the famous fortune teller, Zelda who could look into the future. And I said, Zelda, is it true that you can look into the future? She said, yes. For $500, I will answer any two questions. And I said, $500, isn't that a lot of money? He said, yes. Now, what's the second question? <laughs> I said, will I be elected Vice President of the United States? He said, yes, you will be elected Vice President of the United States. I said, thank you, Zelda. And she said, thank you, Fritz. So it, it just depends on who you're talking to, or you got to know who you're talking to these days. But President Ford had carried 27 states, and even on the day of the inaugural, which is a day much like today, I thought something might happen to turn it around. I had a feeling that it was sort of slipping away that morning when they escorted me out into the cold and Senator Mondale into the heated area I had a feeling that we'd probably lost. And then a few moments later, I saw them escorting Billy Carter to his seat, and his military aide was carrying a six-pack. I knew pretty sure that it was about over. <laughs> but uh, but I still remember at 20 minutes at 12, I turned around to Senator Strom Thurmond, who's the ranking Republican on armed services, in addition to being the father of the century. And I said, Strom, there's still time for a military takeover. Well, you all know what happened. They didn't fire the cannons till after the oath was taken, and they were pointed in the wrong direction anyway, so it wouldn't have made any difference. So, so we've come to... Uh, accept the change in administration. Since uh, then, I've been doing a lot of work for the handicapped, the Republican Party. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
and working on a book with Alf Landon called Victory is Right Around the Corner. So we try to keep busy in those ways. Now, I've been in the Congress, uh, some here may think too long, but I don't share that view. And every year I've been in the Congress, I've been on an agriculture committee. I served in the House for eight years, and I was on the House Agriculture Committee. I started off so far down on the line I couldn't even see the chairman. And I was asked one time, when do I get to speak? Or I asked one, I said, well, in a couple of years. And so I understand the problems in agriculture from that standpoint, not your standpoint, from that standpoint. And then when I was elected to the Senate, some of my farmer friends said, Bob, you ought to get off that Ag Committee because we never agree anyway, and it can't do you much good. One recommended that I get on the Foreign Relations Committee and stand next to Senator Fulbright where I'd get on television. I wouldn't say anything, but people would see me and say, oh, isn't that Bob Dole behind Senator Fulbright? Well, I decided to stay on the Ag Committee, and I've been on the Ag Committee for nine years, and I'm now the ranking Republican on the Senate Ag Committee. And I think I understand some of the problems. When you think you understand all the problems, that's time to move on, either in farming or in politics or in the legislative area. But I understand one thing. I understand the impact that NFO has had on legislation. And I mean that in a positive way. And I've come to know I've come to know and come to respect the dynamic leadership and dedication of your great president. And for that, I'm very much appreciative, Warren Lee. And I hear a lot of talk about farm prices and holding actions and things that may even go beyond. And I look to this group as the pioneers of that movement. You're the pioneers. You called our attention to the fact that we needed higher prices a long, long time ago. And I don't mean to take anything away from any other group, but I just tell you that's a fact. <laughs> and I think Chuck Frazier, who sits through all the hearings and listens to all the members in the Senate and the House, that must be a terrible job to have to listen to us all day long and was with us through every minute of the conference committee on the Farm Bill, which some people say is no good and others have a different view. But I want to assure this group that I'm not standing here as some uh, bitter Republican. I assume I may be outnumbered in this uh, audience. In fact, I may be the only Republican in this audience. I don't know and I don't care. But I'm here to suggest that we work very closely with Orrin Lee Staley and with Chuck Frazier and we look to Chuck Frazier for leadership. And Chuck Frazier looks to you for leadership. And I think he'll agree, and I'm certain he has. And I'm not here for any brownie points, but we've, we look, frankly, to Chuck Frazier and to Jerry Reese during all the consideration of the conference on what do we do about prices? What do we do about target prices? And I know that every administration has their problems. We had ours. They're having theirs. And we had to fight in the Senate to raise the target prices for wheat. And it was Bob Dole who was fighting to raise target prices for wheat. And here all of a sudden, Republican was leading the charge, and he's being attacked by Democrats. And we won by four votes in the Senate, four votes. And we wouldn't have had those four votes without a great deal of work from this organization and your leaders. And because of that four votes, and because of that four votes, about a half billion dollars more is going into the farm economy. And I know you don't want payments, but there comes a time when we look at agriculture and the future of agriculture, particularly the future of young men in agriculture and young women, we've got to protect what we have, and we don't have many farmers left. So I say it based on conviction. I say it because I believe in your leadership. I say it because we've had our disagreements. 
But we've always had one common objective, and that's rural America, and how do we help rural America, and how do we preserve rural America? And that hasn't been a Republican or a Democrat or an independent view. And so for those who may be total partisans in the audience, Republican or Democrat, that just isn't the way the system works once we get into the Congress. Now, I want to talk about just a few things as I see it. You may agree, you may disagree. Let's take a look at what Mr. Staley has talked to me about, what Chuck Frazier has talked to me about. In fact, I've changed my mind on this issue. Orrin Lee Staley has spoken out very clearly and very strongly in opposition to the proposed fuel tax on barge lines. And I agree with his position. And let me give you just a few minutes of background on this and, and a number of others. Very early after the Congress reconvenes next January, if we ever adjourn, if we do reconvene next January, there will be consideration given by the Senate to a bill which is of extreme importance to the entire farming community. It is H.R. 8309, a bill which authorizes a new lock and dam 26 at Alton, Illinois, on the Mississippi River. At the same time, the bill provides for a fuel tax of six cents per gallon on the fuel burned by the barge lines. Now make no mistake about it, that increased cost will have to be passed on immediately to the shipper. And that means a corresponding reduction in the price paid to farmers for his grain. And what is being done is a basic change in U.S. policy, unchanged since the beginning of our republic, a fee for the use of navigable waters. And the technique that is being used is to withhold approval of the lock and dam, though through which much more tonnage passes than through the Panama Canal. And we're going to say to the American people and those who use that facility, unless you agree on a big user fee, you're not going to get the improvements on Lock and Dam 26. And what we're really looking at for the first time in history is an export tax on farm products. And this legislation merely puts the barge lines in a position of a federal tax collector on your products. And also, obviously, there will be an increase in the cost of barging fertilizer and fuel. And the cost price squeeze will increase its pressures on you and reduce net farm income. And there's going to be an attempt in the next month, in the next two months at the outside, to increase the tax from six cents per gallon to a higher figure, one as high as 42 cents per gallon. Another proposal would levy a tax not to exceed 1% of the value of the cargo plus transportation. Now that doesn't sound like much until you put a pencil to it. It means that $8 beans would have a tax or a reduction of the farmer of eight cents per bushel. And any attempt to increase the fuel tax, in my view, unless it's absolutely necessary to get some compromise, and I don't think it will be, but any, any attempt to increase it beyond six cents per gallon must be defeated. And I urge you to let your congressmen and your senators know of your feelings before they go back to Washington. Now let me take a look, as I see it, as one member of the Senate Agriculture Committee, on another matter that I think is important to farmers and to many in this audience and to many in this part of the country. Let us examine another item which directly affects the demand for corn. We have in this nation a corn refining industry which buys about 10 percent of the corn marketed by farmers. This domestic demand is important to corn producers, and competent economic analysts tell me that this adds 25 to 30 cents per bushel to the price farmers receive. Now you would think that with all this demand, the administration would try to get farmers even better prices through proper use of this. It would surprise you to know that the administration reacted to the U.S. International Trade Commission recommendation for an import quota of 4.275 million tons of sugar by actually saying the following, and I quote, it would be of questionable benefit to the domestic sugar industry because it would encourage increased market penetration by substitute sweeteners, that's corn, particularly high fructose corn syrup, which can be produced at a lower cost 
than most U.S. sugar. Then proceeded to announce an illegal payment program, in fact, encouraged imports of sugar. Now, the Congress reacted, and I might say it was a Democrat's amendment. An outstanding Democrat from Texas, Texas Congressman De La Garza. We responded by passing the De La Garza Amendment, which involved import duties and fees. And to this date, imports are still pouring into this country because of the delay by the administration of carrying out the intent of Congress and the will of Congress and a Democrat's amendment to the Farm Bill. And at least one million tons of sugar have poured into this country with a tenant loss of markets for corn producers of about 60 million bushels. And according to the executive vice president of the National Corn Growers, I quote, the loss of a market for 60 million bushels of corn will reduce the price of corn by about four to five cents per bushel. And we're talking about 250 million to 300 million dollars in the farm economy. And I want to make it clear that this decision by the administration put foreign sugar producers ahead of the welfare of domestic corn growers and the domestic sugar industry. And there's another matter that bothers people in my state of Kansas, and I know there are Kansans here. I haven't yet spotted the sunflowers, but I think, oh, there they are back there, right. On November 2nd of this year, Mr. Brezhnev announced a Soviet grain harvest of 194 million metric tons which fell short of both the Soviet target of 213 million tons and the USDA estimate of 215 million tons. Now, many of us, including Senator McGovern of South Dakota and myself, are wondering, as we did in 1973 and 1975, how we always seem to miss it, how we always seem to miss the Soviet crop. And we're not even certain now whether it's 194 million tons. So we've asked for hearings, and we hope to have these hearings in January. We want to explore with the CIA, and they're in that business of trying to decide what the Soviet crop will be, and USDA officials, the possibilities of more precision in USDA estimates, and whether the monitoring of exports can be better accomplished so that farmers will know when to sell and when not to sell their grain. And I'm certain you understand that I assume that the Soviets didn't announce the shortfall until they'd purchased about all they wanted because they don't want to raise prices when they're buying. I also think that an area that we need to address and one we are addressing, one that we're cooperating with other members, and that's a more aggressive export policy. We need a more aggressive and realistic export policy to better meet the competition we're facing in world markets. We must not be just the world's residual suppliers as we are now, and as we have been in the past. And I think there are a number of things we could do and do very quickly. In a letter of October 20, 1977, to President Carter, 16 of my colleagues on the Senate Ag Committee and I asked that the administration double the funding level of $750 million for Commodity Credit Corporation credits. And that, and that was done on November 17, 1977. Secretary Berglund, who's trying to do a good job, announced that the CCC credit allocation of $750 million would be increased to $1.5 billion. Now, we believe, those of us on the committee, that if they would commit this very promptly, it would help farm exports and help farm prices, would also help us in competing with others, Canada, Australia, and others in world grain and other commodity markets. Secretary Berglund may have said last night, and I didn't have the opportunity to hear him speak, but he's testified before our committee, and I quote, the commodity credit program makes money for the government because they pay higher interest rates than it costs us, so it's not a money-losing proposition. Another area that we could look at very quickly, expand export-import bank credits. On September 8, 1977, I wrote the President of the Export-Import Bank asking that XM Bank's credit commodity export policy be revised. Now, let me just say very quickly, we're talking about a program that underwrites the sale of between six and ten billion dollars of annual U.S. export financing. Six to ten billion. Now, what do you think agriculture gets out of that? Seventy to ninety-five million. 
out of a six to ten billion dollar program and we've suggested just some modest increase of at least a half billion dollars to help finance agricultural exports and if we don't accomplish it through negotiation we hope to do it by legislation in addition i would invite this great organization to support efforts of myself and senator humphrey to authorize ccc credits to such non-market economy countries as the people's republic of china the soviet union and eastern european countries such as germany and czechoslovakia i think soviet credits ought to be premised on freer immigration of people from that country i also oppose extending credits to vietnam north korea cambodia laos and cuba but here again i think secretary bergman would like to embark on this program but there's some feeling in the State Department that we shouldn't do this. Now, if this doesn't happen, then again, uh, those of us in the Congress who have the responsibility, Democrats and Republicans, will be trying to get in legis legislation enacted next year. We ought to make better use of our Food for Peace program. This was signed way back in the days of President Eisenhower in 1954, and since that time, we've shipped over $30 billion worth of commodities. In a letter to Secretary Berglund, I recommended that $1 billion worth of grain and other farm commodities be exported under Title I of PL40 to help meet the food needs of developing countries in the fiscal year 1978. The administration was nearly a month late in announcing their FY78 allocation. Instead of being a $1 billion, it was $800 million, which is $66 million less than the last Ford allocation. So not only are they short on their allocation, up to this time and it's three months past in this fiscal year, almost three months, they've only signed one agreement, and that with the country of Egypt. And one way to improve farm prices and to take the pressure off the American farmers to get rid of some of this stuff and export it and get it out of the country and raise the price. And we have the tools and we ought to use those tools. And I hope we do. Everybody agrees we ought to be more vigorous. We ought to spend less time worrying about some international commodity agreement where we always end up in the short end of the stick, whether it's a wheat agreement or a sugar agreement or what. And we ought to put our resources into market development. I kind of share the view expressed by George Meany. I read it across the paper in the Kansas City Star this morning. All this so-called free trade or fair trade or whatever it is is a joke because we're always the ones who are hurt, whether it's workers or farmers or whoever. And I think it's time we start reviewing some of those policies. <laughs> Another thing that we've learned is that they would buy more in foreign countries if they had some place to put it. Now, some of us think we ought to use the existing authority provided in the so-called Food for Peace program to write into some of the agreements that some of the currency can be used for storage facilities. And this would materially assist in the, not only the storage, but the consumption and distribution and, and the reduction of waste of food in some countries, such as India and others, where they report that the rats may get more than the people. In addition, we have, or will have, if we get unload some of the commodities we have a lot of storage space in this country many countries we think would like to buy if they could store it here so they wouldn't be sub subject to any embargo hope we never have another but if we should have it would be their grain so i've offered an amendment which has been adopted and is now law which says that a foreign country can buy the grain and store it in this country for 12 months or longer for subsequent ex export without being subject to any export restrictions or controls. And finally, I want to say this about Geneva trade negotiations. You know, those of us who represent farmers, and some may not feel that we do, but it seems to me that any administration, whether it's Republican or Democrat, always go off to these trade negotiations kind of wondering about agriculture never really focusing on agriculture. And I just happen to believe that we can't be mousetrapped into any agreements that would work to the detriment of farm 
exports. And I believe that we must not give away easier access to U.S. markets for industrial goods or agricultural commodities by reduced tariff or non-tariff barriers without attaining greater access to the markets for our products. And greater access to world markets is the most important objective for U.S. agriculture. So I just suggest this, when they sit down in Geneva and start talking about barriers or non-barriers, both the industrial and farm items must be brought along together, not separate us from the industrial part of the talks. We must not go along alone as we did in previous rounds of negotiations. So I would just say in conclusion, and I remember my good friend Hubert Humphrey, who's your friend and who's very sick, and we all pray for his recovery. But I remember one day I was walking back to my office and I ran into Hubert and I said hello. And about an hour later I said goodbye. And I learned a lot because I listened. But Hubert is a great fellow, and I was on my way to the floor at that time where I walked into the chamber and Senator McGovern was speaking, and he's my friend. And he said, now, gentlemen, let me tax your memories. And somebody jumped up and said, why haven't we thought of that before? So <laughs> we're really trying to help you. But if I had to summarize in two minutes, there are a lot of things we can do with the existing tools we have. One, we could commit the additional CCC credits immediately and stave off some of the competition. We can, as I said, increase the exports under Public Law 480, Food for Peace. We can expand the financing under the so-called Export-Import Bank, where we, we finance six to ten billion dollars. And out of that six to ten billion, only between 65 and 90 are agriculture financed. So I suggest we raise that to a half billion dollars. We ought to support Commodity Credit Corporation credit legislation where we can extend credit to Russia and China based on certain assumptions, because they might buy our products. And I think we have to support with new resources, if necessary, more market development. We have to make the most out of our efficiency, and we shouldn't make concessions at Geneva. We have to use PL40 to improve storage and permit stored grain to be stored in this country. So I guess I could sum up what I came to say. First, to, I'm here to, to indicate my support for American agriculture, the Farmers National Farmers Organization, and I just happen to believe that if we would start pursuing some of these laws we have on the books, and I don't say it to take issue with the Carter administration, I say it to help Secretary Berglund. We want to help, and we will help, because he has his problems too with the State Department and others. And I, but I urge Secretary Berglund to set a goal of $30 billion in farm exports by 1980, and then take the appropriate actions such as those I have mentioned to make it become a reality. In addition to the recommendation to stimulate exports, you know, in this new farm bill that Chuck will tell you about, and Orrin Lee's probably told you about, we have a new section for disaster reserves. And this section permits the Secretary to purchase wheat and feed grains, hay and other livestock forages for disposition in disasters where they may be economically used. Well, it seems to me that the time you want to buy that for the disaster reserves when prices are low. And that time is now. And so I recommend very sincerely to my friend Bob Berglund, let's start making those pur purchases now for the disaster relief that may come later. Hopefully not. But that also would raise market prices. So it seems to me that uh, we have our work cut out for us. What we need, and I'm certain you would agree, is less rhetoric and physician papers and more constructive action. And there's an old Chinese proverb that states, the well-being of a people is like a tree, and agriculture is its root. Until a relatively few years ago, there would have been little disagreement, if any, over the statement that agriculture is our most basic industry. Almost instinctively, people agreed with the Chinese proverb. Today, many Americans, unfortunately, have a quite different concept. Please turn the tape over to side number two, for continuation of the speech.
farm costs are going up, the cost of food's going up. Going up from what? You can't make a living now. And it seems to me that maybe sometime uh, Mr. Staley ought to be on there with Mr. Cronkite or somebody else saying that's not quite the way it is. They never tell you about the cost of government in that little summary they give out. They never tell you about the cost of OSHA regulations. They never tell you about the cost of that little pamphlet they published last year in our administration about, you know, talk softly around your cows and manure is slippery and all those things that you didn't know. <laughs> that cost a half million dollars. If you didn't get one, they were bestsellers. Not among farmers, but a lot of people bought them for jokes. They thought they were a joke, and they were a joke, but it cost you a half million dollars. So, I guess uh, after having said that, I, I think if, if, if those of us in the Congress do anything, just forget about our politics, but there are those, in the Cong those of us in the Congress in both parties who very, feel very strongly about the marketplace, who feel very strongly about improving your income, and who want to get the story told. And I don't mean to stand here and criticize the media. I just suggest that for some reason, every time there's a raise in the consumer price index or the wholesale prices, there's always some big headline, food prices rising. Well, maybe food prices are rising, but I haven't seen them fall when your prices fall food prices don't fall, but when your prices rise, <laughs> if your prices rise six cents a bushel, that's a headline. Still not the cost of production, but they rose. So I just think we have an obligation, and we can do it for you in a nonpartisan way. To every chance we have to speak, whether it's to this group or some industrial group or to some civil rights group or whatever, to try to alert them to the cost when they talk about consumer price index and wholesale price index. How many here can produce wheat for $2.30 a bushel? I, we can't do it in the state of Kansas. And they don't know that on CBS or NBC or ABC, but they're learning. They're learning because of groups like this and because of leadership like you have. And so I just suggest that we're going to be there. We're not going to be agreeing with everything, but we agree with the basic understanding that you have. What brings you out in the cold is the fact that you want better prices, not because of greed, but because of need and because you want your children and your grandchildren to stay on the farm. And I can't think of a better place <laughs> or a better goal for American agriculture. And so I suggest as one who knows it's a lot more fun winning than losing, that you will win and that your point of view will be heard and is being heard. But don't take the pressure off us because we have an obligation. We are accountable. We can be removed. We can be defeated. And we can be helpful. Thank you very much.